Coloration is an important feature in organisms. It is used mostly for camouflage, but also in communicating, demonstrating health, and advertising interest and availability in mates. It can also be employed to threaten predators of poisons, and used by harmless animals to mimic creatures that invest in biological toxins. Coloration is also used in temperature regulation, sun protection, and deterring parasites. In plants, it can play a much wider role, such as in photosynthesis, where red light is absorbed and green light is reflected. When designing creatures, especially while using the natural world as inspiration, these are factors that I like to keep in mind. We will mostly be looking at megafauna today because, frankly, that is the category I have most developed in Chimia. As I further develop the microfauna, such as snakes, birds, and rodents, I may make another coloration video discussing them. As camouflage is often the most important factor in coloration, let's start here. In Chimere, there's an important contextual difference between the ecosystems and correlating ecologies of Earth, which is that most dinosaurs, which are generally the dominant megafauna in a given ecosystem, have excellent color vision. With their bright orange fur, tigers famously stand out to us against the backdrop of the forest, but they don't to deer and boar, a tiger's favorite prey. To a deer, a tiger's black and orange stripes blend into the greens and browns of the forested backdrop. They can't tell the difference between green and orange, so the tiger blends in perfectly at a much lower cost. In Chimere, this strategy is not so efficient. Although there are deer and boar, many of the herbivores are parxosaurs, which can see in the full three-color spectrum that we humans can. The reverse is also true. Canids, hyenas, and felids, the top predators of Earth, are also color deficient, so herbivores seeking to hide from them don't need to invest in such coloration as green. The competing predators of Chimere can see mammalian predators vividly, along with the prey species, putting mammalian predators and prey both at a visual disadvantage. To top it off, many dinosaur predators like firebirds and megaraptorans can see in the ultraviolet spectrum, meaning that many organisms practically glow in the dark. Many mammals of Earth, such as marsupials and monotremes, have been shown to explicitly shine radiant colors when viewed under UV flashlight. Many placental mammals also do this, and the trend appears to be generally mammals that are nocturnal or crepuscular. In some cases, this fur may be absorbing the light and have a muting quality, while in others it more explicitly glows, which could be utilized in communication. Although it has been proposed that this is partially due to perspirating toxins from their diet into their fur, Others have suggested that this might be an evolutionary throwback to when these animals were more regularly hunted by predators that could see in this visual spectrum, and even now with some raptors. This is very much the case in Chimere. The non-Therian mammals which dominate the eastern continent and have a few representatives in the known world often combat ultraviolet radiation by developing a vibrant UV color to create a sort of visual noise which can be highly disorienting. Others secrete a substance which dampens their ultraviolet radiation, giving them an edge in hiding from dinosaurs. Some have also evolved seasonally green fur, requiring a great deal of vegetation to accumulate sufficient pigmentation. None of these adaptations are present in the Therian mammals that dominate the known world, which must rely on other means of camouflage. Patterns are the easiest method of camouflage for large mammals competing in an ecosystem ruled by dinosaurs. There is intense pressure to evolve patterns that assist in camouflage to give them the best chance of success. 
Although the housy prairie is in part dominated by mammals because they can digest the housy grass more efficiently than dinosaurs can, the grass is also a uniform yellowish brown, which mammals have a much easier time camouflaging into. It might seem advantageous for mammals to evolve green fur, but the melanin that our hair produces simply doesn't come in that color, and it's not terribly common among the dinosaurs of Chimere either. Green is, simply put, expensive. Smaller animals get by because the forest floor is typically brown. Lizards and small dinosaurs can become green easier because they're smaller so don't need to invest as much in pigmentation. Larger mammals, especially those in lush or wetland environments, will forego grooming to allow certain algae to grow. This trick is famously employed by the Kurajaku, a large semi-aquatic megaraptor ant, which grows long, frayed feathers that are a perfect nest for a species of algae which only grows in their feathers and hides. Exceptionally old individuals will often be completely green and look overgrown with vegetation. There are several species of dolphins, sloths, cervids, and mosasaurs that all grow their own species of algae, providing them with a cheap source of this otherwise expensive pigment. Coloration and pattern often shift in priority during the mating season. Many animals, especially dinosaurs, use bright colors to signal their health and virility to potential mates. Mammals often engage in physical contests. Dinosaurs will sometimes fight, notably Parxosaurs and Titanosaurs, but many dinosaurs battle not with tooth and claw, but with vibrant display. It is nutritionally expensive to grow such structures and colors. This signals to potential mates that they are capable of acquiring more than enough nutrients to survive. Vibrant colors and contrasting patterns are often employed by animals which invest in biological toxins, such as a venomous sting or poison secreted from the skin. While they may carry toxins sufficient in killing even the largest threats, these still often result in their own injury or death, so alerting potential threats of mutually assured conclusion is typically sufficient to send these threats on their way. Some animals, such as the viper, weasel, and dire badger, signal with contrasting colors to warn not of potential venom or poison, but of a foul smell that they can leave on the attacker, which will make further predation complicated, or a general ferocity and a promise that if attacked, they will make sure to deal lasting damage and don't care if they die in the effort. The guchar, a large non-therian mammal, is both venomous in its spur and has a mane so dazzling in the ultraviolet spectrum that it often disorients and even sickens the megaraptorans which might otherwise prey upon it. As the nutrients involved in a rancid spray, poison and venom, and steel-balled conviction are expensive to maintain, many animals take on a flashy color or striking pattern to mimic dangerous creatures in their environment. In our own world, juvenile cheetahs look quite a lot like a honey badger, and cats will hiss and fold down their ears to resemble a snake. In Chimere, mimicry is quite common. The insectivorous etekan and juvenile nahashet intelligence both strongly resemble the now extinct spotted hyena, to either deter predation in the first case, or endear themselves to packs in the second. The spotted hyena was a highly violent and dangerous animal recently hunted to extinction by the first children. Young titanosaurs will hiss like a snake, thrash about their tail, and arc back to drive home the point. The five species of titanosaur found in the known world will each mimic a local venomous serpent in vocalization, behavior, and pattern for the first few months of its life, until they reach around the size of a cow at a year old, and can then rely more on their armor and claws to fend off predators. 
Sometimes animals will mimic each other for mutual benefit, as is seen in juvenile Uktan, a huge Megaraptoran, and the Drokel, a sprinting Parxasaur. These two animals evolved side by side on the prairies of the eastern continent, are fairly recent arrivals to the known world, and thrive in dominance in the Housie Prairie. Unlike the other Megaraptorans of the known world, Uktan mate for life and dedicate many years to fiercely defending their young. A side effect is that when other animals stumble upon a juvenile, they can be assured that elder siblings and the parents are likely close. Like many Parxisaurs, the Drokel is a combative creature. Adult males are invariably scarred from clashes with other males, where females are equally scarred from their own battles for dominance, and mating usually ends bloody for all involved. They are one of the fastest animals on the prairie. When attacked, they will often flee. However, males in particular will sometimes charge predators, risking injury and death to ensure that the herd survives, often taking, often taking their attackers with them. Young Uktan benefit from being mistaken for a drokel because predators know well of these parxisaurs' penchant for violence. The drokel of all ages benefit from being mistaken for a young Uktan because 6 to 10 ton defenders might be a charge away, and in some cases, Uktan might even mistake a drokel for their own young if upwind, and that moment of hesitation can be all the parxisaur needs to make a hasty retreat. Naturally, the coloration of both help them camouflage in the prairie habitat that they call home. When designing your own creatures, it can help to keep two factors in mind, ancestry and context. Animals coming into a new situation, be it a new niche or a new ecosystem, have adaptations that help their ancestors before them, and this is reflected in their coloration. This new context will further influence adaptations and coloration. The common ancestor of tigers and lions likely had rosettes. Although we cannot say for certain that this is the case, as their common ancestor existed around 10 million years ago, as the leopard, snow leopard, and jaguar all have rosettes, as do juvenile lions, I'm pretty comfortable with this assumption. Tigers adapted stripes, and lions lost all pattern on their pelt, to better blend into their respective environments. Many mammals invested in variations of brown patterns over other colors, as generally speaking their competitors and predators no longer had strong color vision. Natural selection will generally favor those individuals in a population that can make the most out of the least in terms of cost for coloration. Although remember, that sometimes animals have striking colors for social purposes that are often more important than camouflage. If you're giving your creature bright colors, you can assume that they, or a major player in their ecosystem, have color vision, and that this pattern is worth the investment and risks involved. Countershading is a phenomenon when an animal is dark on top and lighter on the belly, which, as the name implies, goes against the natural lighting of a shape and helps them blend into an environment. This phenomenon is especially common in marine animals, and large aquatic creatures will often have a black or dark gray back with a white underside. It is also worth mentioning that many animals don't bother with intense coloration or striking patterns. Simple shades and patterns can offer camouflage in a wider range of habitats, making your creature more adaptable. And don't underestimate the potential for a really beautiful creature design with a simpler palette. Also note in this picture that the adult and juvenile have very different coloring and patterns. This is pretty common in nature. The reasons can vary, but it usually comes down to juveniles having to worry a lot more about predation. You can infer from this piece that the adult is large enough that it might only have one or two natural predators. There could be a dozen or more creatures in their ecosystem looking to make a meal out of the juvenile. They are also smaller, and so can hide in a lot more places, making a generic mottled pattern highly versatile. 
Differences in ontogeny like this can be a great way to add natural complexity to your designs. You can of course design any sort of animal you want, especially in a fantasy design, but when speculating with plausibility in mind, especially in such fields as paleo art, this can be a very useful lens through which you decide how to employ color in your creature design. There are no doubt many factors for coloration that you can consider, and I surely missed a few key points to address, but I wanted to keep this to a digestible length and more to get you into a creative and thoughtful headspace, offering a few tips to have at your disposal. Also, I got an incredible number of submissions when I asked for examples of creatures that members of the community designed. Thank you all so much! I wasn't able to work all of them in due to the sheer number of submissions and relevance to the examples I had already recorded, so I've put together a compilation video of all of the submissions. So much great thought and creativity went into these designs. I'm really blown away. I strongly encourage you all to check it out. Links to that here. Do at least three things today that make you happy. These are crazy times we're in. Take joy in the little things. Thank you all so much for watching. Have an incredible day. Cheers, folks.